Good afternoon. My name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president of the U.S. Institute of Peace, and I am so delighted to have a chance to welcome you here for a really extraordinary event that honors simply amazing women. Um, they are here because of their courage, because of their uh, valor, and because of their commitment to overcoming violence in their countries. This is very near to our heart and our mission here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. We were founded uh, by Congress some 35 years ago, dedicated to the proposition that peace is very possible. It is ultimately a practical exercise, and it is essential for our collective security. And the women who are here today, uh, as part of the US State Department uh, Women of Courage awardees, each one of them has a story uh, that is about working to make peace possible, working in very practical ways. So we are pleased, we are honored to be co-hosting with the US State Department uh, Overcoming Violence, a Conversation with Women of Courage. Um, and this will be a focus on women who are making peace possible in each of their countries. And I know I've had a chance to talk with a number of the women who are doing extraordinary work. They're legislators, they're lawyers, they're uh, human rights attorneys, they've started organizations. Um, they are doing simply tremendous work, and I wish that we could spend many, many hours hearing about their work and understanding how they're changing their communities and contributing to global peace at the same time. Um, let me just extend a very special welcome to the 2018 International Women of Courage awardees who are here with us today. Congratulations to each of you. Thank you for everything that you do. Um, I hope you have a very enjoyable, a very productive time here in the United States. Know how much we appreciate everything that you do. And with that, I'm delighted to turn it over to my good colleague, uh, Kathleen Kunist, who is the USIP's Director of Gender Policy and Strategy, um, who has worked long and many years on these issues. Kathleen. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you for your leadership on this agenda of women, peace, and security. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We made it through the snow days, and uh, we're also very happy to have you here. We're joined uh, by webcast as well, so I want to say hello to everyone near and far who uh, might not have been able to join us today. Well, it is a real honor uh, to be able to co-host this event with the Secretary of State's International Women of Courage program and also the International Visitors Leadership Program. I hope you all will consider tweeting this afternoon at hashtag Women of Courage. And then please follow these women for the next three weeks as they go out throughout the United States to really uh, be diplomats from their, their countries and to learn about the United States. Well, for those of you who might not know very much about this award, it is in its 12th year. This is the only State Department award that pays tribute to emerging women leaders worldwide. And this special award recognizes women around the globe who have demonstrated exceptional courage and leadership and advocating for peace, justice, human rights, gender equality, and women's empowerment. And as you will hear in just a few minutes, these women have often become leaders at great personal risk and sacrifice. Since the inception of this award in 2007, the State Department has recognized 120 women from more than 65 different countries. The process is one in which U.S. diplomatic missions, uh, they nominate uh, a woman of courage from their respective host countries, and the finalists are selected and approved by senior department officials. 
following these meetings here in Washington and the actual honoree ceremony tomorrow afternoon, they will travel to eight different U.S. cities and they will work with uh, both organizations, nonprofit, businesses to really have a dialogue about strategies and ideas to empower women both in the United States and abroad. So a very warm, warm welcome to all of our honorees and to our audience, please know that in addition to the nine honorees present today, they are joined by their great interpreters. So you may hear them on the other side of this wall. We want to really thank them for their dedicated service during today's program and then throughout the three weeks. 50 years ago, Martin Luther King Jr. stated, those who love peace must learn to organize as effectively as those who love war. King recognized that good leadership is needed to organize for peace. It is a st defining starting point, especially as he emphasized that a genuine leader is not someone who only seeks like-minded people, but a leader is someone who brings people with different ideas together to make positive change possible. The women you will meet this afternoon are leaders who love peace and know how to organize for change. The stories told by these women will remind us again that most leaders are not born leaders. Instead, leaders like these women emerge from tough challenges, sometimes nearly impossible challenges. And they transform their leadership and harsh realities through their imagination into something new and something bold to improve the lives of others. Moreover, today their stories will help us demystify the human force of resilience and recognize it in the human face of women. These women are courageous, creative, clear-sighted, and relentless leaders who redefine the concept of power in their pursuit of a better world. As an anthropologist, I know firsthand the power of stories and the power of stories to change lives. Over the next three weeks, these women will be telling their stories to hundreds and hundreds of people. And over the next hour, their stories will teach us, their stories will remind us that we are not alone in our own struggles against injustice and unfairness. That it is, in fact, our togetherness that is a defining and transformative force to make change happen for those whose dignity has been stolen by circumstance. So it is now my great privilege to introduce to you each of the 2018 Women of Courage. I will ask each awardee to stand and remain standing so that you can recognize and celebrate each of them. I would be grateful if you could save your applause until the end. And I will tell you that three of the awardees will join me in a panel discussion here on the stage, and then we will open it up for questions and answers from you, the audience, and the honorees. So um, I will ask the honorees for their forgiveness, because I don't speak many of the languages in which their names are well pronounced, so I will do my very best um, but I would like it if uh, Dr. Yulitsa Velenuva of Honduras, please stand. She is the director of the Honduran Attorney General's Forensic Medicine Department. Ailea Kalaf Saleh is from Iraq, and she is a volunteer humanitarian. Do I see her? Ah, all right. 
from Italy, Sister Maria Elena Barini, nominated by the U.S. Embassy to the Holy See. She is a Catholic sister of the Sisters of Charity of the Saint Jean Antida Thure and works in the Central African Republic. Aima Umarova of Kazakhstan. Thank you. She is the defense attorney and co-founder of Human Rights Lawyers Public Fund, working with domestic violence in her country. Dr. Faridi Rushiti of the Republic of Kosovo, founder and executive director of the Kosovo Center for the Rehabilitation of Torture Victims. Galiva Mukasarasi of Rwanda. She is the founder coordinator of the Solidarity for the Development of Widows and Orphans to promote self-sufficiency and livelihoods. June Sirakan Karensiri of Thailand, lawyer and co-founder of the Thai Lawyers for Human Rights. She has friends here. <laughs> Fans. Uh, Roya Sadat of Afghanistan. Roya is a filmmaker and founder of Roya Film House. And Maluma Saeed of Mauritania, member of parliament, the Mauritanian National Assembly. Please join me now in giving them a warm round of celebration and applause. Thank you, women, and I'm now going to invite the panelists to the stage. Roya, June, Maluma. Great, thank you. We have the right equipment. And you should know that we'll be on channel one for English. So you might want to take a moment here and uh, go ahead and uh, make sure that you have... Turn around this one. Okay. Good? Oh. Wonderful. Is it working? We just want to make sure our, uh, everything's set up. All right. So let me explain how we hope to uh, run this panel today. Um, I've asked each of the panelists to share their story with you. As you can imagine, there are six other stories, and I hope you'll follow them on the uh, internet, on the website of the State Department. Each story is compelling, and you will hear that as well with our uh, panelists today. I'm going to ask them several rounds of questions and then I will open it up to you, the audience. And so I hope you will be thinking of questions or comments that you would like to share with them. Again, I thank the interpreters for their help today. And we will begin. We are going to begin with uh, Roya Sadat. Roya is a creative thinker who refuses to be silenced in the face of threats from conservative elements within Afghan society. Using cinema and television as platforms for advocacy, she is promoting positive change by telling the untold stories of Afghan women and girls. Roya, can you begin by helping us understand how you came into this stream of storytelling. I think of film and television is a very powerful tool. What was your inspiration and when did this all begin? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, let me first uh, say 
Um, hello, everybody, and uh, uh, respect and uh, thanks for from uh, Foreign Ministry of United States, um, a special U.S. Embassy in Afghanistan that they recognize me as a cor courage woman. Um, I would like to say we have many courage women in Afghanistan, and I am a sample of them in one of them. Um, when um, our friend uh, uh, say for me, you have a panel in the United States uh, uh, Peace and Institute, uh, something's coming in my mind that I'm going here in Peace and Institute uh, to talk as a person that I never live in a peace. I born when in Afghanistan was on Russian war in 1983. After that, I spent the civil war and then the Taliban coming. Um, and I cannot go out of home for five years. Um, so I would like to say it's the peace became the only hope uh, for me to see my people live in the peace. Now I start about myself. Um, I, I studied law and political faculty when I, um, the 2011, after we can start again study and can go out from home. Uh, but it was in my dream, uh, and I love cinema, and I believe cinema. But because in my city, we didn't, we didn't have cinema faculty and cinema university, then I think in the social um, subject like um, law and political, it can help me also. So I study law, and then I start uh, to write a script. Uh, when I was at home during the Taliban, and I wrote my first film script at that time. Uh, and then after the 11th September, when something changed in Afghanistan, uh, I make my first film. Uh, in 2004, uh, some people, especially in Minister of uh, Culture in Afghanistan, they introduced me the first woman film directors. It's mean before me, we didn't have woman film director. So it's mean my people in my society really didn't know, understand about the cinema and especially special uh, woman filmmaker. So it was a big challenge for me in the beginning when I started. Um, I, I make four or five films in that time and then uh, got a, a scholarship to Asian Film Academy for uh, short training. And uh, I live in Herat and then invited with the uh, Tulu TV. It's the biggest TV station in Afghanistan. And I start uh, to making the first Afghan TV drama. The most subject that I make it, it's about more than 20 documentary and for uh, future films. Most of them uh, is about uh, women's rights and many problem, social problems. And also in 2003, me and my sister, we founded um, the first international women film festival in Afghanistan. Uh, and in 2004, uh, we founded the first women film company, the name is Royal Film House. Um, and we was, me and my sister and other my colleagues, too serious to attention and uh, social problems, especially the points that it's um, not easy to people to talk about it. Very some, like taboo subject and especially about uh, women's rights, about uh, law in Afghanistan. As you know, uh, we are faced to of course, you hear about Afghanistan, about uh, uh, 
um, terrorist, Talib, Daesh, it's uh, part of war in Afghanistan. Uh, but in the same times, uh, we are faces uh, with fundamentalist people and religious extremists. This is the, m the most problem in Afghanistan to a special, um, it's a big challenge for the people who work in media and cinema in, uh, uh, in, in culture. But I believe and uh, why I'm too serious during this 15 years with many challenges and I'm doing very hard working because I believe in a country like Afghanistan, when we talk about peace, when we talk about women rights, when we talk about human rights, um, the peace is not like a project, not like a name. The peace is a culture. When we want to change something in this country, so it's need we do something so the people mind is changed because they lose one generation before me, two generations before me, they use education, economic during the war. So uh, when we want to rebuild this, uh, this country and uh, we're fighting for uh, justice, so it's need to uh, be serious in culture. So um, I'm happy after many challenges that I don't want to focus for each, each one right now. I know I have a very short time. Very short. Sure. Uh, uh, I would like to see, um, I got very good result. Right now, um, my company is one of the f uh, active company in Afghanistan. Me and my sister, uh, and during these five years, my husband also, we got together, got more than 40 international awards and we start a new chapter to talk through our films inside of Afghanistan and many countries around the world. Um, Roya, what do you think the impact of your films are having? Do you, have you had a way to figure out or to uh, understand more the impact on a day-to-day -day basis? What do you see? Um, I, I hope my English is <laughs> enough English okay is to <laughs> understand me. <laughs> Uh, you know, one thing is, I'm as a filmmaker, I tell stories, many stories. And another thing, I am a story, you know. When I start as a, f a first woman filmmaker, it was many challenges. Lots of people ask me, um, actually, what doing the filmmaker? What you doing? This is, uh, so it's mean, um, not only tell the story, it's a responsibility to tell for people how much the cinema is important for you, and, and special for uh, uh, women, right? So right after me, right now, we have uh, some women film directors, and uh, they have working, making short film, documentary films, uh, and uh, uh, it's mean my, f my work, I think, it's have good effect because after me my sister is starting to make documentary film it was easier for her than me um, she didn't need it to talk with family with my father because uh, I, I, I spent this period and uh, after her my other sister uh, she's now a photographer and uh, also some other woman young woman uh, for now we have um, some women that they are going and selected the art uh, university, especially the cinema department. So now become like a choice. Um, uh, we we and the most difficult story you've had to tell mm -hmm. in your films. What is the, give us a little flavor of one of the stories? Yeah, I would like to uh, give an example for uh, my last film. Uh, the name is the title is A Letter to the President. Um, when I was at law faculty in 2006, I searched about the women uh, in the jail in Afghanistan. There was many stories, a very unjust um, in a lots of corrup uh, corruption in the um, judge. Uh, so um, one part of this film is um, tell about the woman in the jail. And 
many things you in, in the when you watch the film it's a story about young women who uh, have um, and it's huge because uh, the people thinking he she uh, killed her husband and she tried to send a letter for the president but inside the film you you think many things and it show a society uh, in a transition period lots of fighting between the modern life and traditional life um, a lot of things to say about injustice uh, society starting from um, family um, society and you you see like a circle in this round of this circle the government uh, civil society uh, general public people family all of them around this circle analyzing so when we screen this film um, in the center of the Kabul in Sina Mariano you know, in Afghanistan, unfortunately, during the Taliban, they broke all uh, cinema, most of the cinema. And uh, now we have few active cinema in Kabul that only the men go to cinema, not women. So for this film screen, lots of um, people coming to watch this film. And there is many scenes to have to say a lot of things about the uh, women rights. So. I see uh, inside of the film, we have one scene to the woman slapping, uh, wife slapping for her husband. And uh, when wa the people watch this, uh, the film, and also one part to, um, to tell about the injustice law, especially the uh, religious traditional law and the modern. So this two scene, I was worried what will be the reaction of the people. You know, uh, it was the big uh, achievement for me when I see the same reaction between this, many of them was unknowledge people. I see the same reaction which I was seeing and heard of European, like Locarno Film Festival, like uh, French, in French. So it's mean these people are going to change. But it's important they face for their problems. They talk their, the, on their problem. And, and they let get chance to talk about that. So film has become a way for people to reflect on their lives yeah. and, and to begin a dialogue. Yes, I, I believe if some people in the same times, they don't accept and they don't believe uh, when they watch the film, it's enough they thinking about their life, you know? But um, they need to, um, okay. What we'll do, we'll come back. We're okay. going to talk uh, some more about uh, some of the challenges, but I want uh, the audience to meet each of you. Thanks so much, Roya. We're going to turn to June. June, uh, your life in Thailand has uh, become uh, a new world in the last five years. Can you tell us about, uh, one, you know, how you co-founded the Thai Lawyers for Human Rights, but what really initiated this part of your journey. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so from Thailand, I mean, everybody would know Thailand for, you know, very famous, famous for tourism. Many of you may have been to Thailand. Um, just before I become a human rights lawyer. I was just a simple girl, grew up in a small city in the northeast of Thailand, which is the, one of the poorest regions of the country. Um, I was lucky that my family, although, you know, we, the family have, my family have three daughters, so only girls. I was lucky that my parents, despite of financial difficulty, they supported and tried to push their daughters for better, better education. So they sent me to Bangkok, which is the capital, to study. But again, I was still a very simple Thai student with good grades. Up until I had a chance to come to the United States. And I spent one year in Milwaukee with a host family, who happened to be here to my surprise. Yay. <laughs> To 
my surprise because I was going to tell the story, you know, related to my experience when I spent one year in Milwaukee. So my host family is an African American family. So at that age, it was the very first time that I exposed myself to such a diversity with the American culture, with the language, with the family, with friends. And she, my host mother, Gloria Otis, especially to you, she took me travel around the U.S. as much as she could. I don't know if you remember, but she was the one who actually told me about the story of the civil rights movement in the U.S. And uh, I study some of the history of the movement and the democracy movement civil rights. I think that was when I started to broaden my perspective about the world. And then when I went back to Thailand, it was about the time that I need to choose, you know, the subject and the major of my university study. And I thought I was encouraged by volunteering uh, with the tsunami victim back in 2004. And I met with the sea boat people who they were evacuated from the sea after the tsunami hit the coast of Thailand. And that was one scene where I doubt that because they don't have the citizen, they're not Thai people, they were subjected to discrimination and inequality. I asked my senior friend, what can I do? And he said, maybe if you have a knowledge of law, you can help people. You can help marginalized people, vulnerable people. So I came back to Bangkok and then I decided I would do law. And then after four years in uh, university, I started out on human rights work until now. So coming back to the recent situation in Thailand in 2014, we had a military coup d'etat. So they took the power from a civilian government, they repealed the constitution, they used military courts to try civilians, they declared martial law nationwide, which gave the military power to arrest and detain a person up to seven days without charges. That was a very immediate response of me and my colleagues. We knew that this is the time when human rights lawyers must step in front to defend the rights of civilians. So we got together. Basically, we just wanted to set up a legal aid center, make phone calls, receive the, the complaints of the arrest and attention, and we go to help them. We didn't think that we would continue to be in, in this organization called Thai Lawyers for Human Rights. We thought, well, the military government would give us back democracy maybe in two months. But we were wrong. Until now, almost four years, the situation remained the same. So we grew rapidly. We have now 20 people working for us, although if you compare to the workload, we're still in a very small number. But my, in the course of my work, I think my inspiration and motivation to work, even I'm facing challenges for representing the pro-democracy student activists and groups, is actually them. It's the courage, the bravery, the commitment of the pro-democracy student activists. I hope they're listening. I don't know if they are, because many of them, some of them, are in jail. And this is just a start. It's an ongoing process. So I just hope that you will feel that I'm here not just to the people who are struggling for democracy and human rights back home. Can you give us just a little photo or image of maybe one of the stories of the students, since they have so inspired you, it, without naming names, but somebody who can give us a feeling for what they have gone through. So right after the coup, um, there's a lot of restrictions that have been imposed. As I said, the use of military courts and the junta, the military government, banned um, a gathering of five persons for political purposes. When you say political purposes, you, it can be anything, actually. Talking about human rights can be political as well. Politicians, academics, prominent figures, they were all under restrictions. So there's this small group of students 
that came out. They form the group, they gather, they move simultaneously, naturally. Very small gathering, peaceful, symbolic activities. For example, because they said five people cannot gather, so some of the students came up with some activities like standing one person each inside of the mall in Bangkok, and then reading like a book of 1984, eating sandwiches, holding signs, and guess what? They were arrested. So, but they didn't stop. They started coming out. There was a screening on the Hunger Games, the, the Hunger Games movie. And that, from that movie, there was um, the three finger salute like this. So they came out and started to call out people, to encourage normal people to come out and say this is peaceful and this is how we can express that we, we disagree with the ruling. They did that. And guess what? They also arrested for doing this, free salute finger. They didn't stop. So until there was a big case where I was involved, there were 14 student activists who marching and protested against the ruling, the military ruling. They were arrested and charged with violating a ban on political gathering of five persons and sedition. They were brought to military court at night. My colleagues and I, we went to the court to represent them. The military court decided to de remand them for 12 days. So they were sent to prison. Along that 12 days, they deny, they deny to request a bail because they insisted that they didn't do anything wrong and they did not accept the jurisdiction of military. So is this just one of the examples of, of the cases that I and my colleagues have been you know, defending? And that's just a bless for us that we have worked with, for this young, courageous heart that you know, made me move forward until today. Thank you, June. We're going to come back around and I'm going to ask you what some of the challenges are from day to day moving forward. I'm going to turn now to introduce you to Maluma Saeed. She is the Deputy Member of Parliament. And uh, Maluma, Mauritania come last country to abolish. If you want to hear English or if you want to speak English. You uh, hit the English button if you want to. Um, this in the world. Can you give us a little feeling for your background, your journey, your woman of courage experience? Please. Please. Uh, Uh, my name is Maluma Saeed. Uh, there was a technical problem. We apologize. My name is Maluma Saeed. Uh, please. Uh, my name is Maluma Bente Bilal Saeed. I was born in a, uh, in a city called Abatelmeet. Before I start speaking, I would like to sh thank uh, the American Embassy in Mauritania for uh, giving me this award uh, for, uh, and for everybody who came here and participate in this uh, program, either from the IVLP program or Congress or from Meridian and others who have uh, worked in this program. My story is long. I cannot uh, describe it in a a short time, but I can give you some highlights of my program. Uh, this struggle started, I, I was born in an enslaved family, and I was lucky to be the first person in my family to go to school. Well, that was uh, not a, uh, that was a big deal, because uh, the man who uh, owned my family and he wanted to move my, uh, fam my mother to the city, and then I was able to go to school. Uh, the uh, second uh, issue was that I did not continue my education because in high school there was a group of students 
uh, who were slave or previous slaves who were emancipated sl slaves they studied at uh, an occupier school and they wanted to defend themselves and they wanted to defend the uh, the uh, enslaved the slaves around them and they needed help and so I was I helped them and I was 17 years old so I participated with them and then after that we had an opening and I participated in a in a uh, in a party and I started uh, helping anybody who was uh, enslaved I got into all of these programs that were uh, and then in 2006 there was a military coup and there was a quota for women and I was lucky to be one of these women uh, who were uh, who were uh, nominated uh, for my party and I became nominated for the Haratin uh, party and I was on top of the uh, I was on top of the list and there were 13 me uh, men and one woman on the list and I was in our uh, group uh, one and that during that time I tried to be a, a peaceful woman who uh, uh, who who uh, defended her rights uh, that uh, rights that were not given to me and there were uh, many uh, there were many issues especially the issues of uh, uh, of uh, prisoners in jail and there were there was nobody defending women and I but the government was opposed to anybody who was fighting for slaves rights and uh, anybody who talked about this so I became uh, through this simple experience in five years, it was a simple experience, but, like it, but it gave me a, a uh, impetus forward for for me and for all the women who were in my uh, in my social status uh, to as parliamentarians to be able to go in. And I was elected again into uh, 2013, and I am now in my second session in the parliament in 10 years. This was the last time. Uh, th this. This became uh, my way to d defend women uh, in uh, dis discrimination, uh, enslavement, anything of that part, and as and as a and and especially women who were in this in this difficult situation, it was very difficult. This this uh, this the. Uh, uh, so then, uh, you know, women were treated in such an awful way, and her rights were uh, definitely violated time after time. So I did speak to the Minister of Justice so many times about uh, these issues in prison and otherwise. So I wanted to tell you these few things, few factors. And yes, there are many, many uh, challenges that we are right now experiencing, but these, uh, these are challenges, uh, whether it's uh, from our group, Haratin, which is marginalized, but there are others, other groups, and there are political groups that are pro and against the government. But we are now, uh, as a, a group or as a partners in parliament, we are actually coming together to defend uh, the rights of women and those that are mar marginalized throughout society, and especially uh, women that that are still enslaved in our country today. Kind of a pick is like what when you talk about a woman uh, being enslaved, what is her day to day life like in Mauritania? Uh, yeah, there are two kinds of women, one that are actually uh, enslaved, that's what they do, they work in uh, in cooking and working around the home, domestic uh, duties, they may go out to uh, feed the, the cattle, etc. outside, and then have some that are like in between uh, women that have some rights, they ha she has her own home, she goes to work, uh, may, whether it's political, whether it's with, mini, mini, with government, whether uh, teaching and so forth. So women are really succeeding in all these uh, areas and all these areas where women are actually working in, they are succeeding and especially in, uh, in the banking or financial uh, matters, finance, they have done uh, great uh, in that arena as well. With new, uh, are they making progress with new laws that have been 
put in place. That we have been, uh, we are progressing right now. We have actually ministers that are women. We have ambassadors, and we also have many in parliament. And so right now we have about 19 percent, less than 20 percent representation in par in the parliament. So now there are more ambitions on the part of women in Mauritania. And so we could say it is slow, but it is it is there at where it should be at this moment. Uh, um, I guess we have to take these off here. Um, I'm going to ask the panelists to uh, talk a little bit more about uh, not only the challenges they see, but how they would define success in terms of overcoming violence within your own society. What does that look like, and how does your work contribute to that effort? Roy, I'm going to come back to you. Thank you. Uh, so I think uh, when I talk a few things about the uh, challenges, it's mean um, I think uh, it's enough you be as a woman in Afghanistan and work a sensitive kind of work like cinema. It's a big challenge. Um, for example, in the beginning, it was uh, it wasn't accept with my family. Uh, about five years, my uncles they don't come to my house to visit us when I start my uh, first farm. Um, so a kind of job uh, like making film, acting. Um, music or working in media, this is a kind of sensitive job in Afghanistan for women. Um, another challenge is um, security. You know, this, it's, when you talk about security, it's not mean uh, when any area or any city that Talib or Daesh was there, it's insecurity. If they wasn't, it's secret. It's not mean. And secret, it's mean um, when you feeling the people don't like your job. It mean it's unsecret. Um, as I told be, uh, in the beginning, lots of fundamentalist people and religious extremists. This is the most. Um, uh, have most effect in kind of job like, like so I do. The biggest challenge. The biggest saying. challenge, yeah. yes. Um, for example, when I came here uh, a few months ago, I started make a new t a TV drama for uh, Tulu TV. This is uh, uh, about a young generation, and they try to bring change for people. They're active, they're modern, they're, they're different than. So um, when it's, we start shooting, um, we give a house, but after two, three days, we understand here is n we are neighbor uh, <laughs> with a um, commander family there. So he don't like film, he don't like camera. Um, so, but um, one day we have um, a very long scene when with more than 100 men. And only me as a woman, I direct all of them and talk with the camera department, with the characters and running. And so, um, and that day I, I remember um, my small monitor to watch the acting, it's got a problem. Then I, I running with the, the cameraman who keep the steady cam. So <laughs> this uh, man, our neighbor was looking from the window and say for his bodyguard, who is this lady to running between 100 men in the street? <laughs> <laughs> so, it was, you know, you when you don't uh, feeling your in secret, so it's a, a big challenge. But in, uh, if you look at 
pro and professionalism in the, my work. Another challenge is, um, besides the security, uh, economy. Because sometimes I thinking, um, of course, um, our government always say welcome uh, for all of us, for uh, our work. But they're too busy for the security and political issues, not on culture. So no attention from uh, culture ministry or other department for cinema, for culture. And um, so it's very really difficult. You must, we don't have, um, I remember for this, uh, my last film, a letter to the president from 2009 until 2016, I follow with many film market. When uh, my film uh, selected in, uh, in Poussin in Gothenburg, one of the best uh, 20 film script in Asia, then we talk, when we talk with the international producer and they, announce we uh, like this uh, film and we're going to produce. And then when I go back in Afghanistan, they search about Afghanistan after one or two months, they say, Roya, we are sorry, we cannot produce film in Afghanistan because there is no security. Finally, in 2016, I speak with my sister and also with my husband because two of them work in my company. And I say, I, should, I must make, make my feature films to Tell for all this international producer, of course, here is not enough security, of course, here is many challenges, but here is still the life is going on. We have many stories to tell. So um, last year I uh, finished my film and I got many successful um, uh, feedback, uh, many international awards and uh, I say and I announce my, my speech about the problems of uh, producing film in Afghanistan in Locarno when my film have the international, the world premiere. So, um, when, if Royal, I... Royal, where, where can we see your films? Are, are they on the internet? I'm sure some of our audience would like to see them. Uh, you know, because the film don't have distributor yet, and we look for someone to distribute the film. So it's not on the internet yet, but if any possibility to screen one evening or one night, um, you're welcome. <laughs> it's with me. <laughs> yeah. That's great. We'll yeah. <laughs> we hope we get that chance. Okay. Great. Okay. June, <coughs> what about some of the challenges and what do you see uh, on the road ahead for the students who have been imprisoned for your work and uh, what will success look like, say, in five years? Uh, challenges are the, you know, the, the decline of democracy and rule of law, the breakdown of the rule of law, democracy due process in Thailand after the coup d'etat, um, constitutional legal framework that have been imposed by the military government, have negatively impacted or um, in itself violate fundamental rights. As I said, the rights to uh, free expression or freedom of assembly, uh, peaceful assembly have been restricted. Um, also, the risky and insecure environment that human rights defenders, human rights activists, lawyers like myself and my colleagues have to operate. I'm one of the cases that um, have faced what they call judicial harassment by the military government, you know, for, for the role of defending some student activists. But there are many others that also faces this um, legal trouble as well. So what is our role? I've asked myself and my colleagues because We've been defending most of the opposition or undesired by the military government. And of course, you can guess, we never win the case because it's in their venue, it's in the military court. One thing that our clients, not just the student activists, have told us is that they're really thankful to have us here with them. It's very basic that everyone needs to have a lawyer. They need to have someone that they can trust they can confide with, and that although we, they know in their heart that we're not going to win this fight until democracy returns, 
but we have to be there. Sometimes I feel like, oh, I feel so bad being a lawyer and knowing that we're not gonna win the case. But what can we do? We have to be there, we have to ensure minimum access to justice today. So I would consider that is the essential reason of our existence, of our work, and many other people who are fighting in Thailand. Over the course of these three years, finally we have some acquittals. We have some cases that might be considered successful because the court acquitted the activists and didn't jail them. But it came in very late time. The Ministry government has promised many times to have the general election so that it was, it's going to be a first step you know, to have the civilian administration and to have the functioning mechanism of democracy come back. But they've been postponed many times. And this year we really hope that they would, you know, oblige to their promise to international community, including to the US as well. So looking ahead, if even we have the election, it doesn't guarantee that means functional democracy. We have a lot to work on from our country. But in the meanwhile, I think it's very important that international friends other countries also look upon Thailand, watch us, tell them how they should do, how, sh how they should not go backward. And I, I think that's important why I'm here to get your support on that. Because anyway, we have to fight from the within. Um, five years, I hope, that we will see some of, you know, the, the return of democracy. That is uh, really a tall uh, challenge, it sounds like right now, but your determination to keep, as we say, telling truth to power is uh, really, truly courageous given the circumstances and keeping the story alive for these young people. Maluma, so you're one of the few women in the parliament from a marginalized group. How have you done this? How have you find the courage every day to figure out how to navigate power and to do it in a gracious and powerful way? A very important question and difficult to answer, but I will try. It is true. I am from a large group. It's a, we are the largest population in Mauritania, but it is uh, the most marginalized uh, group in society. We are, we are five women from this group, from different uh, parties. I am the only one who can say from uh, one of two women who are up in opposition party in the same group, the problems we, save, we face every day are problems that we must face. The first problem, there are two problems, is that I must be there every day and, ev and in every committee, and I must always talk and stand up to all of the ministers who are there to teach everybody. and. And you must be there for all uh, the, uh, try to adjust all the uh, laws that are there, there because it has not been easy for me, but I have put my whole effort to reach what I needed to reach, to achieve everything I have achieved, but I have achieved a little bit. But in 2007 and 2013, there are many, uh, there were many laws that were, uh, that were uh, amended and uh, that was uh, due to the party that I was part of and the organization I was with that my husband uh, runs uh, they we, we gave amendments and they would uh, write down the amendments and I would present them in Parliament and you can say that I was able to add two or three points in each law uh, so that those who did not those who 
those who did not uh, deal with a case or uh, that was against a slave, I can take them to jail. Uh, but we have we have many laws. Uh, uh, we have we have laws and we have different work that's different, and there's difference. And then after that, we must defend and we must work hard to implement the laws that were there. That's why. Uh, the there's many laws that are not applied and even though they're there and that's why we must work very hard especially as women in that uh, in that way we have this this we have instability in our laws because of the different uh, coups that we have had and different revolutions we've had and that has made us uh, work harder but we are serious about our work in uh, part of my party in our organization and there are uh, several officials that work with us uh, we have we have uh, brought in others who have worked with us and they have been leaders with us who have helped us defend our case and we all work I cannot work in one uh, on my own we each work on our own but we bring in towards the same cause and I'm able to say that we have reached at a, at a, a, a stage to this day that I'm with you, there was the there was a minister that was with me last month, and I talked to him last week, and uh, and I have seen it today on Facebook because I told talked to him about it, because he met with somebody from my group, because he he wanted uh, to deal with somebody who was deal who was from my people, and so uh, they uh, th they put that man in jail. He challenged the minister, and then I talked to the minister, and I told him, "You may not. Uh, I'm going to tell you the truth, and you may not put me, you may put me in jail, but uh, you are not going to silence me." And so now they have released the man that was put in jail for standing up to the president. And therefore, we have to talk. We have to face the truth, even if we both uh, we all end up in jail. And even if I am ended up, I end up in jail on my own. That was uh, something I said to the first minister, and and, and I said uh, when the ministry talks about us, it does not talk about about this group. Does not talk about economy. It does not. It it talk does not talk about our issues. It uh, we are here, and it does not take care of us. Our government does not take care of us as a marginalized group, and their policies do not take care of us. And that's why when I faced him and I told him about that. Uh, sharply, he and I started talking about the prisoners who are uh, from my uh, group of people who are with me, and I also talked about the freedom of uh, speech, uh, freedom of speech, because we we have uh, declined, we have a decline in freedom of speech in uh, press and uh, interviews. And uh, now there is a, a tightening of freedom of speech because the military uh, government does not like uh, us talking and sharing and, and talking publicly. And I told him that he cannot step back about uh, freedom of speech because there are many prisoners who are political prisoners who are uh, uh, freedom of speech prisoners. How can and I told him how can you talk about freedom of speech when you have so many uh, when you have uh, stepped out and and not uh, and, and not uh, respected the rights of many people, civil rights of many people. And so now I face the minister and uh, he, he talked to me and he said that you, he responded to me that you talk to me in a very clear manner and you present your people. And I would like to talk a little bit about the challenges that uh, our people face and the women uh, face. Women in Mauritania have a big problem because women cannot um, cannot uh, ca uh, nominate themselves into any party. Uh, they have to be in a party, and when they are in a party, there's a lot of competition with men, and when uh, then they are, uh, they, uh, they compete against men, and they compete in their tribal that uh, tribal groups, and that's why they're m the women who are nominated are very, very few, and they have to be very strong in, a in order to be nominated, and that's why the uh, women from my group are the smallest group of women who are nominated because when we talk about a an equal society when we talk about women women who are nominated are from a higher group and from a uh, upper uh, echelons of society that's why uh, women are always in all groups are the other lowest 
and also education in my group is uh, difficult. Even though the government has opened schools uh, based on our party uh, requirement, uh, our party requirements, and asking us. However, slave children cannot go to school. Poor people cannot go to school. Uh, but your father and mother are not able to buy for you food, uh, clothing, and and school equipment to be able to school. That's why they prefer uh, that you go to work and be able to support yourself instead of uh, uh, going to school and, and using up their money. That's why I asked from the Americans to help us build schools to these poor people and uh, and to uh, pressure the government to send uh, the poor students to schools so that they can be educated and reach a higher, uh, higher education levels. And more than... Incredible spirit it takes to stand up to those who uh, still do not have democracy and an opportunity in life. We're going to open it up now uh, to the audience uh, for uh, Q&A. And &A. And what I'd like to do is take about three questions and then uh, turn it back over to the panel. So uh, I have one here. And I'm, if you would just show your hands. So we have uh, mic runners. Uh, one, two, and a third question. Right here. All right. Perfect. We'll begin here. If you wouldn't mind standing up, introducing yourself, and then asking your question. Zainab Aswaj from the American Islamic Congress. Thank you very much, ladies, for the uh, wonderful uh, information and the courage that you have to overcome all the obstacles that you have. Ma'luma, shukran jazeelan, wa andi su'al ilik. My question, I'm going to say it uh, uh, in English so everyone can understand it. It's hard to hear. Could we uh, increase the mic sound? No? Okay. And um, uh, through the parliament that you are a member of right now, would you, were you able to uh, designate some laws to protect uh, people from being under slavery? And if so, what have you done? And how successful is that effort? Thank you. Thank you so much. Right behind there, please. Did you have a A country that has great filmography, <laughs> uh, tele, uh, dramas on the television that also uh, address social issues. We have had a military coup and we still suffer the consequences many years later, I'm sorry to say. And we also have had slavery in Brazil and we still have young women caught up in, in homes and are treated like slaves. My question to you is, what message do you have for young people in my country? <clears throat> and I'm, maybe I need to slow down. But um, recently, we had a young woman who rose up through um, the social economic um, ladder to become uh, a congresswoman. But she was recently shot. I don't know if you heard, like a week ago, not very long. It, it was a dramatic event in Brazil. And she represented women of color, women low income, and also all LGBTQ community. And she was just murdered in, in plain sight. It was a very ugly thing. And so how do we encourage young people to get involved in politics and in social movement when literally their lives are at risk? You know, it's hard to motivate young people. What hope and encouragement can you provide people in my country? Thank you. Thank you very much. Another question. over to you. So the first question, yes, to you, and then the open it up about, I think everybody can talk about young people. Thank you for the two questions. The first question is, what are the laws that I was, I helped uh, 
uh, in uh, obtaining that helped our people. Of course, it was not very easy to first to get there. We are, of course, in the opposition party, and we, it was not very easy for us to operate. But in 2006, there was an agreement between our party and also the president that was elected. So I could be, so we, that was one of the promises that he gave us. And one of the laws that uh, we agreed upon, you know, even before the election, that he would have our, would have our, su his support, uh, that was available to us. So th this was a condition. So after that, uh, if you, because in this uh, law, uh, there was an amendment. It says that if the slave would inform anyone that he is under slavery, then he would be thrown in jail or prison. Right now, the amendment actually says that any person, whether he is or she is a slave or uh, maybe a witness or maybe a, a neighbor, could actually inform the government or the authorities about uh, his slavery. And now, in 2013, we had a conversation about the, uh, uh, the head of the coup and so and we spoke about the, what we needed to amend even in that first version of the law. So, and we wanted to make this as a crime against humanity in our constitution or set of laws in, uh, in Ma Mauritania. And then, so our people, Taban uh, Haratin, uh, also supported me, my people, to get to that. So right now, it, it is in the Constitution that it is a crime against humanity, the slavery. So this is another uh, goal or another level we were able to attain. As to the second question, I would like to know uh, how can, s in, Bra in Brazil, for instance, uh, or other countries, how could they be motiv or motivate young people? Of course, that is a long, long road. But first of all, you have to have security, you know, under the law uh, in the country. So the first thing is to have peaceful action and then to and get to the people that are actually suffering under the, the slavery or these conditions and then organize them to, uh, to get their message across to the government. So these, these are the basic steps uh, that you have to deal with. I advise that would be, the struggle would be, uh, the demands would be all under in peaceful uh, demonstrations or expressions uh, and so that's how we can obtain our rights at the end. For adding the second question, I'm going to go to June here. Uh, in terms of what what is it in, with young people and how to <coughs> create some hope and a message given these very difficult circumstances in Brazil, Thailand, Afghanistan, yeah. or Tony? I would answer from taking myself as a young <laughs> person as well, working. I think it's the action and encourage others to, to join the force. You know, as I said, when we decided to set up our organization, Thai Lawyers for Human Rights, it was very immediate reaction to the problems. Even before the students or the young people came out on the street. So I think it's important that one need to start something first. Secondly, um, having working a lot with the, the young clients, I've seen that they they very you know they full of energy. They want to, to experiment or try something new uh, new every day until until they learn they, they realize you know that perhaps they need to be more organized with their movement, try to educate try to um, talk to the society more, try to use very simple and normal language to not just highlighting the group of young people, but also to convince all members of the public to join their force. So we have, I've seen the development of um, the youth and the young movement over the course, I mean, in, uh, after the coup data. 
some of them even now trying to set up um, a very formal political party or institution in, pe in preparation gearing toward the election if we have one. But, you know, that means that they come across, they, they see the importance that they're the one who are going to be living in the country. Why the old generals, I don't know when they're going to go, but they're not going to be living with us. So I think it's, it's that hope and the messages that they and us, as a supporter of the force of, of this movement, have to keep it going. Would you like to talk about the, how to Thank address you. this? I heard this morning that the country of Afghanistan, over 50% of the population is under 18. I believe that was the quote given today. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's say I answer the, the, this question in my language to, to give a better answer. Um, you know, in Bari Tashwira Jawano, Barezike Jawano, Madabashan Wakan, Bari Bari Mubariza, Bishor Mohammed. I think we have a translator. Do we have a translator for Dari? Yes. Done. Channel 5. Okay, uh, thank you. I think it's in Channel 5. So. Okay. It's okay? Yeah. Mm. Uh, better is that the people who are in the the و برای رسیدن به مفاهیم چون برابری عدالت اجتماعی حقوق فردی حقوق اساسی اگر اندکترین شک در فکر و اندیشه جوانا وجود داشت بدون شک روند مبارزه بسیار کند می سازه ما چیزی که باور دارم است که جوانان با تشویق بشن به که فکران ذهنان و عملان این مفاهیم قبول داشته باشن و این به این معنی است که باید سات تحصیلات و سات آگاهیشان بلند برن ما فکر می کنم که در سخترین جوامع و در سخترین وضعیت ناممکن نیست تغییر یک چیز ناممکن نیست و و باید آدما تلاش کنند تا روند تغییر تبدیل به یک جریان بسازند یعنی که از نسل جوان بیشتر تشویق بسازن تا این جریان اونو مو انرژی به وجود بیاره و باعث تغییر بشه حالا از هر گوشه یک صدا از هر جا و این مهم است که چقدر کسانی که مبارزه میکنن عمیقا باورمندن و من مطمئنم که تاثیر خود میمانه در قسمت سوالی که شما داشتین 50 درصد ما دقیق متوجه نشدم که 50 درصد از جوانان افغانستان چی, چی گفته مشخصا متوجه نشدم English please if you could please re ask your question yeah if you could please repeat your question or if somebody could ask to address young people in this situation yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, I give her answers. Yes. Just uh, your question about the 50% of young generation in Afghanistan. I don't understand uh, your oh, question. Uh, no, I was just emphasizing that uh. Afghanistan is a very young, young country. country yeah. and, and so this is a very prevalent issue. It's great. Yeah. I, I want to um, ask the audience if there are, is there another question right here? Two? Okay. Great. Right here in this, uh, this row right here as well. All right, please, introduce Hi. yourself. Uh, my name is Jen, and I'm the founder of Four Girls Global Leadership, and it's a social change movement women peacemakers. And what I, we did a survey, a global survey of women's empowerment for what we call the millennials, and that's younger 
generation, anywhere in the 20s. And what we have found, and this ties to the youth question, is that actually this takes men. And in fact, the young generation and the millennials, the young men also wanted to be empowered. That's what we found from our survey. And, and so how do we have this conversation, especially now, which for me, I, I see a global movement of Me Too and not just in the United States, but everywhere from Iran to Brazil to uh, Saudi Arabia is having a transformation of women's empowerment. How do we engage young men in this conversation and not, not uh, blame? Um, I've heard the patriarchy argument and I've heard, and I just don't think it's a productive conversation when we're bashing another gender. So how do we have a productive conversation engaging young men to be part of this solution as well? Thanks so much, Jen. Please, um, Stephanie. Hi. Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Stephanie Foster, SMASH Strategies, formerly of the State Department, and I served in Embassy Kabul, so I met you, Roya, when I was there many years ago. Um, so my question is actually a good uh, kind of segue from that. Um, how do we help tell your stories in a way that kind of creates a better understanding of the nuanced picture in your countries? Because my experience from working in, at the State Department and working in this arena globally is that people have a very one-dimensional view sometimes of the lives of women and men, but primarily women in this conversation. So how do we help people have a more nuanced view of the challenges you face and what's going on and sort of how to take those challenges and turn them into progress so it's not so unidimensional in terms of the way that people understand what's going on in a particular country? Thank you both. Um, great questions to end this uh, uh, event with. And I'm going to ask our panelists to not only uh, answer one or the other question, but then to make your final remarks, and then we're going to close it, uh, the session. Would you like to begin, Maluma? Would you like to begin in answering one of the questions? Thank you very much for this question. That has to do how can we uh, get uh, the young millennials to deal with women and give her the right uh, to, b to have equality uh, before the law? I say that in uh, many of uh, societies, there are men who want to know, young people who want to deal with women. Well, then I think there is an important point in society, in schools, now in schools, uh, men and women are understand each other, especially in this uh, in in this social um, social media uh, social media age, where there's a way for them to communicate, and where there's women uh, are equal to men, and as a result of this awareness, also b making women's issues aware, also make men. Uh, aware and able to help women in their right to reach equality and also women as young people uh, they are able to prove that they are worthy of this so that men are, ab are willing to give them uh, authority and give them participation in society. Thank you. Uh, uh, for the second question, I d I'm sorry I don't remember the second question. I don't think the second question that question is for Ms. Roya, uh, 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 it uh, has to do with Kabul and how to understand women there. But I can s answer as a woman uh, who is a, a woman who is part of this uh, great uh, courageous woman group, it's important also our story is not more important the stories of the women who are uh, before us or who have stayed in their own countries. They're all women who have fought hard for what they have, but we were lucky to be invited. I don't know why for any reason, but I think uh, I think it's only that with luck that we were invited to come here because uh, in, in my society uh, uh, and all the other women who are here, they're all women who are important and capable women. And we are Huna, like Dr. Kuntz and many others who are here 
our stories are not different than the stories of women who are with us who are stayed in their countries. Whenever I study a woman, a woman I, I learn about another woman because we all share uh, either our values or our efforts or our stories. So our stories are not unique or our women's of stories are not unique. We all share in our lives and in our uh, uh, shared values. Gina, would you like to uh, talk a little bit about how, uh, how we engage young men in a, in a non-blame way and also make sure that uh, we're arm in arm with the future mm. in front? Very interesting to to know the findings of your surveys. Actually, I, mm, it's a very difficult question to find answer. But I think um, one thing is somehow the millennials or the younger generations, the further they are they are they born into this internet world or social media. I think um, it's closer, but they're losing connection with previous experience. I, I don't know if it's, you know, like, like for me, I think we are trying to, to involve them and, and give them the traces of, or the history pass on or, or some, some stories that pass on connect to them more and more. But it comes to the challenges of different types of communication, languages that are not really match at them, like immediately. But I think that that occurred to me when I worked with, with very young, like below 20. And um, one or two or three times, we don't understand each other. We need to continue the dialogue, talking. And actually, they, they like to see it by the action more than we tell them. So they don't like to be preached. So I think that would apply not just to young men, but I think um, the new generations that will come this idea of uh, Stephanie's question about stories and how uh, we can help, and I am assuming she meant here in the States, how we can tell your stories better and help people connect to these stories, uh, which we've heard today. Um, you're going to be on a journey for the next three weeks and you will be telling these stories. Uh, how can we help amplify the stories so that more people understand the worlds you're coming from and the challenges you are addressing? Well, for me, I think if we take some moment to imagine ourselves to be in the shoes of, you know, of the women who travel all from other countries. Um, so empathy. Yes, I'm, and and actually, personally, I really don't like telling my story <laughs> because I don't. I, I was not. I was not used to it because I used to advocate for others. I used to advocate to you know other people in cases, and then when I become one of the stories, uh, it took me quite a while to take the courage to to come out and say it because in the way I don't want. Really, I don't feel that I'm a victim. I feel that I'm a fighter. So I think the story is that, you know, you tell how, how they face the challenges, how courageous they are. And I'm, I'm also telling myself as well now that trying to uh, tell my story is still quite awkward. But um, the more the stories go out, that's, that's when we will break the silence of violence. When the stories go out, that is when we will break the silence of the violence. Yeah. Well put. You need to keep telling your story more, June. <laughs> Roya, we're going to uh, close the afternoon with your comments. <coughs> okay. Ma, ne fikir konum ki I think um, that I want to, uh, uh, shortly, I want to say something about the patriarchal societies and countries such as Afghanistan, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. I want to say that, uh, that our countries 
that we're talking about the thousands years of history but this is the time that they need to talk about about a law that has been old and has been there and we need to be talking about changing it uh, now, when we are talking about the laws in a country such as mine in Afghanistan, it's it's a misogynist view. Uh, this is uh, even in our literature, it's a misogynist way. For, for example, if you look at uh, if you look at um, uh, uh, a woman in our literature, you only see her as a mistress, as a girlfriend. Um, my, that's what I think. That when you are talking about the women rights in a country such as mine unless we actually we get rid of uh, these uh, uh, from our literature from our laws from our courts if we don't take it fundamentally if we don't look into fundamental change i don't think we're going to reach our uh, goals there are so many women and men in afghanistan that they are really struggling deeply against these things um, and then uh, uh, how they should hear our stories. Now, I think if if there is no challenges and difficulties, then, then there's no struggle. And if a struggle not at the end be successful, then it means that there was no struggle to begin with. I really believe on that, that anything that we try, any struggle, will have there will be an achievement when I started when I was so young nobody was interested in my work but now I am at a level that there's some of the very biggest people in cinemas writing about the work I'm doing and people who are watching my movies everywhere whether it's in the heart of Afghanistan or rural areas and villages and the world uh, this shows the the feedback. This is the work that I've done. Like people like me, who have worked on this, I think people are starting to look at this patriarchal society or the people who have the views, the patriarchal view. There are some men uh, in my country that some of them. There are people that they think that women should be participated in the society. Uh, they, they think that it's the woman's need that needs to be in the society, but we need to change their view and say, no, it's the society that needs the women to be working there. So this is, this is a very serious struggle that needs to, to happen. Uh, and when we're talking about the wrapping up, um, there's something I want to say that always in Afghanistan, especially in the last 15 years, that it's very important that that at this point uh, from uh, our, the, our international friends, especially the United States, I have to say I'm grateful because there has been changes uh, in the woman's life and the international community has been very effective in this area. Uh, one of the things that I want to say is that, that our international friends focused more on security in Afghanistan. But, but, EK, but what actually get us to security and what will give people that hope to go for a better life, I think uh, people, like those people that we talk about, fundamentalists, and those are who are against modernism and, and um, against modernism, but, but once they actually feel the meaning, the real meaning of life, and actually see the happiness in life, and, and they actually, and I think that they will change their mind. I'm pretty sure about that. Like change in culture, change um, in um, in economy and the status of people's life. I think they're looking into deeply into all of that. Um, this will change, and I'm hoping that they will take this matter seriously. Monsieur um, This afternoon, I think real hope is based on real leadership and it makes real change. And I'm confident that in each of your countries and with your leadership, change is on its way. I want to thank a fabulous audience. I want to acknowledge the other honorees. And I hope you'll join me now in thanking these three honorees who shared their life.